Um, so yeah, thanks for having us. Lucy, do you want to tell us a little bit about you and how you roll? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Lucy. Um, well, I'm, I actually work for the library. So um, this is me, um, what do they call it? Moonlighting. <laughs> um, but in my not so much spare time, I am also a writer. And um, I recently, well, not so recently now, but a couple of years ago, published this book, Beyond the Stethoscope, which is a collection of doctor's stories around themes of reclaiming hope, heart and healing in medicine. Um, I am also a freelance um, facilitator and uh, community development and leadership practitioner, but um, mostly these days employed full time uh, at the moment at the library as the acting manager of engagement, which I love. <laughs> I bet you do. Richard, what about you? What's your story? Yes, I'm Richard. Um, my main role is uh, being Lucy Mays' uh, <laughs> husband. Um, <laughs> Second to that, I'm a GP in uh, Castlemaine, um, working between the hospital and clinic and uh, our health system. Um, and more recently, I've become a part-time dancer and dance instructor with our and flash mob attendee. Are you sure it's part-time? I feel like it's like a full-time <laughs> thing on the inside, but maybe part-time expressed on the outside. <laughs> That's probably more like it, Lucy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Richard, we might start with you. I feel like at the moment... Um, with COVID-19, it's probably a kind of a once in a lifetime, once in a career situation for a doctor. Mm. Can you talk us through a little bit about how you and your colleagues are, pre well, I guess, how did you prepare and how are you coping in a situation that's been incredibly unpredictable? Um, day to day, you're not quite sure what's gonna be happening and people are pretty stressed, pretty frightened. And mm. I imagine that you were pretty busy. So can you talk us through a bit about that? Yeah, I was um, reflecting it. So we're sort of hitting now two months of, you know, actively being involved in caring for the community and the health system in this uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, it's really changed in many ways from the start. There was all we were going on, what was going on in other countries and and uh, the research and evidence, but also the experience of our colleagues in, in other countries, uh, which set us up for a great deal of uh, anxiety and fear for what we were going to, going to meet. Mm -hmm. um, this coronavirus itself and what it does to the human body is something unprecedented. I know it's a word that's been thrown around a lot. but um, <laughs> We should have a bingo game where there's yeah, a certain right. number of words. So if you mentioned yeah. unprecedented, if you mentioned... <laughs> Oh, no, there's heaps, but carry on. <laughs> oh, my, my least and best favourite has been the abundance of caution. Uh, it gets ah, thrown around. <laughs> I haven't even heard that, really. Oh, it's very big in the news early on. Uh, ah, okay. Carry but, on. <laughs> oh, look, I think, um, yeah, it, what's been incredible is um, the adaptivity or how we adapted early on um, when we realised what needed to be put in place to prepare for what we thought was going to be worst case scenario uh, pandemic conditions mm -hmm. in our town and our district. Um, and it was you know, very um, quickly met amongst all the uh, key players in our local community and GPs, the hospital workers, nurses, all the staff involved across the network um, quickly collaborated around creating new systems to adapt, um, new rosters for the hospital, new ways of um, dealing with emergencies through the, through the hospital. And each clinic working together as well as three clinics, we also adapted to provide a safe place. Um, I know uh, each clinic had a, a different version of how we did that. We, um, we had initially a a Macca's like drive through service through our car park down the back door so that no person who is suspected of having COVID-19 would enter the building. We, we would dress up in our full protective gear and, and see them uh, uh, down in, in their cars initially. And, and now we've uh, set up a little satellite clinic just down the road to, to separate the, the ill and, uh, but also to try and continue our work. And adapting to telehealth and um, changing our systems, systems that would have previously taken months, maybe years to 
talk about policy and procedure changes, getting committees to sign off on things. We're getting stuff done in days. And it was so part of that was very exciting, I've got to say. It was exhilarating to see what a group of professionals could do together um, and what how adaptive we were in a crisis. Um, alongside that, fearing the worst. And I think luckily for how things have run, um, we have been able to control the numbers a week. I remember a text I got through from a contact in Bendigo Hospital uh, about a month and a half ago. He said, we're going to expect to see our capacity at maximum next week. Be prepared. Mm. That kind of fear was there. And yeah. um, through the measures people have done through isolation and quarantining uh, those that were suspected of being carriers, we've avoided that, which has been a huge relief. And um, but yeah, it was really on the edge stuff early, and um, it continues to be busy. But we're now in the sort of so that phase was the preparing phase, and uh, now we're in the uh, into the containment, and now the let's let's see what's happening out there in the community phase. So. Yeah. It's interesting, those phases, because a similar thing, similar thing has happened in teaching. And I mm. think we were all running on adrenaline initially. Mm. And like you said, that, that sense of needing to really make stuff happen and be creative and, and put, pull all the barriers to the side and be like, mm. we can't afford to mess around. Mm. Let's just mm. cut through and get stuff done. Mm. Um, mm. And we're talking a lot about what, what is it about that process that we need to hang on to? because mm. it's been quite a valuable steep yeah. and painful learning curve but something that's actually we don't want to lose it because it's mm. been incredibly helpful <laughs> yeah. yeah I have a cough I need to cough now <coughs> excuse me <laughs> I think what I've that. witnessed um in that regard Lucy which Richard was just touching on is the incredible teamwork like they've just pulled themselves together as an amazing team every every facet of the healthcare system in our communities um, have come together and they're communicating regularly and what Richard doesn't share readily but the back end is um, months and months of morning noon and night meetings on top of their normal clinical load yeah. um, and and just the preparation has been extraordinary so um, I think we can all rest assured we're in good hands but you know back to that fear even just on the home front to give it a bit of a personal edge we we were sleeping in separate bedrooms for quite some time because we were worried that Richard would be bringing the you know potential germs home to our family or that we would be potentially infecting him in which case they'd have to close the whole clinic down mm. so you know he was kind of leaving his clothes at the door and getting you know yeah. almost doing a wash down before he walked through the door so it's, it was pretty um warlike conditions and actually Sophie our 15 year old said at one point she said my god dad I haven't I've never seen you so alive like normally he's like a walking zombie and he was just kind of on fire and we're going aren't you supposed to be stressed but of course we realized later it was the adrenaline but yeah. um he was like um, um this is what I'm trained to do like I'm ready to go this is you know mm. mission you know it was a bit mm. sort of all that warlike language that we hear in the media they was mm. they were sort of acting out of that impulse as well as as like the the, you know the soldiers in the front lines yep. getting you know loading and locking their guns almost it was um just this extraordinary energy and um preparation time which which then i think um you know had a big tip-off point as as things changed which is exactly what they wanted you know they wanted it to um the curve to drop and they're thrilled to bits with the community response and the responsibility that everybody's showing mm. um but um uh, but the adrenaline drop yeah. whilst you have to maintain your caution and your preparedness is is like um, emotionally just a roller coaster. Mm. And I guess it, uh, yeah, you mentioned uncertainty and and I think that's what we're also trying to do is every day deal with uncertainty mm. and, um, but uh, to keep certainty came from consistency. And yes, that was very difficult in those early days, giving people a consistent message because mm. the evidence would change every day. It reminded me of when I graduated, the, the doubling time of medical information was about three years. And, they, and that's why they based our continuing professional development on a three-year program. Currently, the doubling time of medical information, generally speaking, is 53 days. And so, and it just seemed to be heightened during this pandemic that our knowledge of coronavirus was changing every day yeah <laughs> and to it's be seen as experts or expected to be experts yeah. in what was going on was 
very difficult to give people that confidence that we knew what we were doing um, because we were dealing with new evidence, new information every day. So. And that scientific literacy, I just know from, I think what I've probably focused on a lot is choosing the media that I engage with. And one of them has been Coronacast with um, Professor Norman Swan. And they were talking, I think it was today, about the fact that um, that that data, that information, that research isn't necessarily always peer reviewed. It's not always necessarily quality research, but this information is mm. getting out there, and sometimes mm. the media latches onto things that aren't necessarily accurate. Mm. And so, what you're often doing, I imagine, I don't know, is that you're you're trying to be the voice that that's overcoming those other louder voices mm. coming through the media. And so, there's misinformation mm. and there's anxiety that's coming from that. And so, your mm. role as I guess a public health messenger is more important than ever before mm, and mm. probably quite tiring. <laughs> I'm imagining. Yeah. yeah. Very much so. In the early days I was I would type, you know, I'd see these threads on on the kind of um what what are the Facebook pages that popped up, the look after your neighbour ones on the well, probably Castlemania as well. And um, all these people were saying, you know, asking questions and, and then lay people giving advice. And so I was sort of like, Richard, I think we need a healthcare voice in this. So I would be typing his answers as he spoke, you know, like comatose on the couch in the evenings. And um, I was sort of putting putting it out there, which poor Rich, you're a bit sick of me putting the, your voice out there on your behalf. <laughs> no, but good. Like it needs a balancing effect. I reckon good on you. So Lucy, very, just... very, very, very putting, expressing words. I even struggled to say that sentence. But... Wow, great segue <laughs> to the next question. So Lucy, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about your book. Mm. Um, so you published at the end of 2018, so it's a while yeah. ago now. The times obviously have moved mm. since then, but at the same time the, the book is about doctors talking about um, their understanding of, of health and well-being, the trials and tribulations of the profession, mm -hmm. um, the difficulty of um, how do you maintain uh, an integrity in a system that often is working against you. And you, you collected these really amazing stories from this huge selection of doctors. Mm. And I feel like a lot of what you were talking about is pertinent now. How do you feel like what's been happening with mm -hmm. COVID-19 has actually brought your book sort of you know, even more into the, the mm. forefront of what is important? Yeah, look, in so many ways, it's quite hard to actually pull out the, the specific bits, but um, probably the first thing I would say is that my primary focus in writing the book in the first place was finding hope, um, and it's in the title. And um, the reason for that was that it was born out of um, my despair and fear at watching Richard sink. So. Um, you know, he was he was uh, struggling with burnout and exhaustion and overwhelm, and and I just was watching this man who's um, who was who you know was dedicated to his profession like a vocation. Uh, he was just born to do it, loves it with a passion, and yet was so distressed and and weighed down by it. And I just thought, how can like the profession would would lose so much if he was to walk away um, and yet how does he stay and protect himself and and remain as the doctor that he always wanted to be which was the wholehearted whole human um, doctor who listens well who practices deep medicine you know um, slow medicine and um, how do you sustain yourself in a system that actually wants you to be a factory worker and, and, and treat people as widgets and push them through as fast as possible? And, and the patients themselves in some instances just want the quick fix as well. They don't um, necessarily want the, the lifestyle medicine um, stuff necessarily particularly, and it certainly doesn't make, um, make any money, the, the longer range medicine. So um, I just, I was starting to imagine what burnout was. And I thought, I think burnout is like a soul death when you're not, when you've got a purpose in life and you're not actually able to deliver that purpose because the system stymies you. Um, and that's, to me, a really nice non-pathologising way of looking at burnout, which takes away the any sense of human failing or I'm not coping because I'm not a coper. Or And doctors are perfectionists. You know, you've got to be an A-type personality to get that far. And then you've got to get through a cutthroat ladder of extraordinary competition at every step of the way where you're just being carved off and chucked on the... On the um, on the pile if you can't hack it and um, only the fittest survive but the fittest also deny parts of their humanity to, to in order to survive and then they get into actually practicing real face-to-face -face medicine 
And without those pieces of humanity remaining, it, they all of a sudden find that they can't actually sustain themselves because that's the bit that feeds them. Mm-hmm. So it's a two-way feeding, like it feeds quality medicine and that's what the patients want from their healthcare practitioners. They want that kind of humanity um, and good listening. You know, it's basic humanity might be a, a um, loaded word for some, I suppose, but really it's just basic human listening and communication skills mm-hmm. that, that actually carry so much of the medicine. Um, so I just started to explore this idea where, you know, with Richard, I could gently name for him, um, there's nothing wrong with you that you're not coping in this system and how, how can we help you to sustain yourself in there so that you don't lose yourself, which he was, and we were losing him at the same time. Um, and I thought, I'm sure there are other doctors who have figured this out, surely. You know, surely they could, they've got their work-life thing going on and they, they can be their whole selves at work and at home. So I just thought, you know, because I was at home with babies and needed a project, um, I would travel around Australia and New Zealand as you do and interview doctors because I was interested and fascinated to find out (laughs) um, why. So that's what I did and and then compiled them into the book, which um, has these incredible stories. But the themes um, are so resonant now, coming back to your question, and sorry for the sidetrack. No, it's good. (laughs) That's good. But they, you know, I guess stress and overwhelm and burnout were the impetus for the book and hope hope was the end goal. And one of the most beautiful things for me that's come out of this time is that um, somebody who follows me on Twitter and who, who's bought my book has suddenly become this amazing champion for my book. And she puts out almost weekly um, updates of your daily dose from my book. So she's putting out quotes to the international medical community of threads of hope for people at this time to sustain them at this time. So that is just like profoundly exciting to me because that's really what I was hoping to achieve was to just some kind of balm, you know, some kind of solace yeah. for this profession that um, puts their heart and soul on their sleeve and and works their absolute guts out. And, and, and that goes for the whole healthcare, you mm. know, profession, not just doctors, but I just felt like I had to narrow it down to a particular um, cohort because they are a particular kind of beast. <laughs> I think she called you a beast, Richard, in a good way. In a particular, um, you know, setting that is complicated, you know, the, 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 the fact that they're likely to be sued for, um, for this uncertain, not black and white stuff that they do with human bodies that don't always respond in the same ways. And, um, and I think the other thing that's relevant at this time um, out of the themes of my book it were, is what you were talking about before with the health literacy, science literacy stuff. Um, and a lot of one of the themes that came through in my book, and probably because I attacked it as a, um, you know, using these fluffy hippie words like heart and hope, I attracted um, doctors who were likely to resonate with those concepts. Um, but I ended up with lots of doctors who were challenging the status quo, um, very um, narrow definition of, of body health and siloed body part health, and had, had as the system does, separated mind, body, spirit, um, at, you know, and tried to treat, you know, the, the person who d- deals with the brain and the emotions is over there treating that part of the person and the person who deals with the lungs does this and the heart and the bones and everybody's treating different bits. But, of course, the bodily system functions as one. And um, so a lot of the doctors who I interviewed have ended up in incorporating much more holistic perspectives into their delivery of healthcare and medicine. Um, and I mentioned lifestyle stuff before, but some of them are, were also Chinese medical practitioners or homeopathic practitioners, as well as um, Western med- med- medical practitioners, and, and we're finding ways to balance those two perspectives. But what they were finding was that the med- Western medical model in its purest form is um, selling itself out in a way and losing people in droves because uh, there's a huge proportion of the population who don't just want to take a pill and mm. who don't actually trust mainstream science. And you see that in this pandemic. They, they don't trust the government and they don't trust science. They're scared of vaccinations. Of course, the other side of the story is the other cohort who just want the magic bullet, the, the vaccination mm. or, the, or the fix it. You know, you fix me. I don't have anything to do with this. But um, mm. anyway, sorry, I think I'm babbling. But um, No, no, just that, 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 that <laughs> I think they're not, they're not necessarily opposite ends of the scale. They can work together, that Western medicine and also non-mainstream medicine and if you're able to combine them and do it in a way that's respectful of both, but also really listening to the patient, that was a big one that came through, I think, from a lot of the stories from when I read it, that, that idea of really listening to the patient's story. And I feel like you modelled that in the way that you really listened to these doctors' stories and then and you told those stories and 
people respond to storytelling. They do. It's just part, it's in our soul. It's in our limbic brain. It's part of the way we learn about the world. Mm, um, right. Yeah, Richard, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about your own well-being journey because mm. you've obviously come from that place of being incredibly stressed at work and questioning what am I doing. What what got you through? How have you managed it? Yeah, it's interesting. I think um, listening to Lucy and as you said, what a lot of came through a lot of the stories is that connection, uh, our connection to the the doctor that we want to be, um, and but that connection with the people that we're caring for, and yeah, a lot of the doctors in the in the book, and I guess in in my story, it was around I felt disconnected because I was just trying so hard to be the best doctor that I I had in my brain I could be which was all about getting the right diagnosis and getting through as many patients through a day as possible and and um, not making any mistakes and um, and uh, yeah and I and I was losing out from not really focusing on that connection and that listening and hearing that patient story and um and therefore disconnecting what my purpose was was to be that uh, in that therapeutic role with with the people i was caring for um so to get back to that yeah it took me and the family we we uh my father died about the same time and i think it really shook me around to say hey i'm, I'm on my own now in terms of uh, my mentor <laughs> and um and yeah and at the same time we were i was burning out and so we moved towns to sort of recheck ourselves and reconnect and what brought me back was realizing that's what the important thing for me was is having a true connection to my my, my work and my and my patients through at on a deeper deeper level and looking at the barriers that were there and starting to shift those down to practicalities of time with patients and not overbooking myself and uh, having time at the end of the day and space for myself. So it was, it was more a change in attitude to the workplace, not changing the workplace more so, but and then what came was to be, be connected. I needed to look after myself and give my space time to replenish. And um, all these lifestyle tips I was giving to my patients, I had to start listening to. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and, and that was finding the joy back. And that's through sport and exercise. Started doing shugung, uh, traditional Chinese medicine. And I think that was all, as you said, that embedding, that intermeshing of different philosophies in medicine, I've always been interested in because I don't think mainstream general practice has all the answers at all and so I've always explored who's in my community particularly I love Castle Maine for its diverse variety of allied health professionals and different medical backgrounds from mm -hmm. Chinese medicine um, with acupuncture and shigong through to um, homeopathy naturopathy and and um, massage and bone therapy I could go on and on and on Mm -hmm. um, we've got a great network in town and I feel that's, uh, you know, patients feel that they've got options and uh, that if, and if someone's willing to explore all those options and they feel more supported and, and cared for. Um, but yeah, for me, it was also exploring those areas for myself. So I discovered uh, Shigun, but also discovered dancing and, and, and joy in, in exercise and and, and the thrill of joining my dance class about four or five years ago now. But um, yeah, that's been a huge part of my life since. And um, yeah, and I, I, I really encourage the people I educate in younger doctors and medical students to bring, bring their passions forward as a priority because it's what's gonna also help you remain passionate in medicine if you're, you're replenishing yourself. It's kind of like nurturing your essence, and it's interesting that that I, I'm I'm intrigued as to why dance, and was that something? No, no, honestly, like was that something before you kind of you kind of hit that wall, so to speak? That was this little kernel sort of bubbling away, or was it something you discovered through an an event or an accident? Why dance? Yeah, interesting. I 
my I come from a family where both my sisters were, and particularly my older sister was heavily involved in uh, dance and particularly ballet. And so I always was the um, dressed up in a tutu or the uh, and practice partner, practice yeah. partner at home. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, but um, and of course, in those days, seventies, eighties, it was um, taboo. Madonna. Yeah, yeah. So um, to be a male dancer, but um, always, I was always the crazy dancer in the dance floor at, at, through university days and school. I, I fell in love with him on a dance floor. <laughs> <gasps> I love right. that. And do, you, do you remember where and what night? What was playing? Silver. Talk H. H. <gasps> I remember Talk H. <laughs> was that in South Yarra? South Yarra? Yeah. 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 Oh my God, that was a bit of a pit. So, and what was, that, what was playing? Do you remember what was playing? Ooh, tough call. <laughs> Can't Up on the jam? <laughs> probably. <laughs> probably. <laughs> probably some of that. But um, it was funny. Yeah, got into, uh, you know, growing up. <laughs> and But, yeah, rediscovered dance by, by um, I was heavily involved in uh, Run the Main, which my sister started in Castle Main, the local fun run that raises money for the hospital. And um, uh, the short story was I became the mascot, being the bird, and um, run the run, run bird run. And uh, and one year there was a bit of a gap between the results of the people finishing the race and the results. And we used to have a band playing, and I just started dancing as as the bird, so just to have people have a bit of a laugh. And we got caught on video and got replayed a few times. And then the next year the run was there and. Then a little crowd gathered after the run around me expecting at the bird dance because it had become quite famous. And, uh, <laughs> so that built on. And after a few years, my kids became teenagers and, and my dancing was very mortified. <laughs> I remember Sophie looking very pale in this crowd of smiles. And, uh, <laughs> and fortunately, uh, I'd also met Sarah Cook, who runs Local Movement Zone, and she... Um, I was telling her in a conversation that my oh, teenagers are embarrassed by my dance moves. I need some help. And she said, amazing. I was just about to start an adult dance class for your kind of dancing. <laughs> <laughs> your kind of dancing? What did she mean? Daggy dancing? Not quite right. <laughs> NQR. NQR. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> kind of dancing just makes people laugh. You um, might have a bit of a demo. <laughs> um, well, I'm wondering if now's a good time to throw to a clip. Maybe, That's shall we? We, yeah. promised, we did promise dancing tonight and we tried live, but we couldn't get the sound quite right. So we apologise. Instead, we've got some pre-recorded footage for you. And this video tells the whole story. Yeah. Makes me be quiet. <laughs> Is it a bird? Is it a bogan? No, oh, it's a country doctor. Richard Mays and his supermarket flash mob from Castlemaine in central Victoria went as viral as influenza. The doctor happily admits that dancing with the so-called Silver Tops dance troupe has restored his health. About six years ago, I was really struggling in the work I was doing. I found it a real joy, but I also was finding it was burning me out. The good doctor turned to exercise to de-stress. About three years ago now, I was a mascot for our local fun run. And uh, at the end of the fun run, I used to fill the space between the end of the run and presentations with a dance dressed up as the bird. <laughs> But there was one big problem. My teenagers were getting more and more distressed at how lame my dance moves were. Seven, eight, and one, two. To the rescue came dance teacher Sarah Sass Cook. I think Richard's been a natural dancer in there waiting to come out. So he was one of my first there on the first night, ready to go. And we haven't looked back since. And that flash mob really had this amazing effect on our local community and wider as the video got more viral. That, yeah, our local doctor, who was known to be just the GP and, and doing his job, was out there being an idiot in a mullet, having a great time. You know, you build it, they will come. <laughs> and um, sort of went from about 40 people coming every week till now like a hundred. Many of the silver tops are Dr May's patients. I think if you didn't turn up in his mullet wig then people would think oh he's going a bit soft. <laughs> Six, 
Margaret Harris gives the dancing doctor credit for getting her back in the garden. Bending down was painful. Uh, gardening was something that uh, I found difficult, but now on my knees I hardly have any pain with them since I've been dancing. It's keeping them mobile. Lose it or use it. The silver tops come in all shapes and sizes and they're now performing all over town. People couldn't get in the building. It was electric and that just showed people want to come and see and support these dancers because they are inspiring people out there. And I think that said it all. Yeah, it's awesome. An entire workshop inspired by the bloke whose job it is to keep them healthy. And his unusual prescription seems to be working a treat. We have fun and it just fills my whole being with sort of joy. The effect it's had on people in terms of realising that the answer to joy and happiness you know, doesn't lie in medicine or a pill, it lies on finding what makes you get passionate and excited and have fun. And I'd say to this day that flash mob event, in terms of a health promotion activity, it's probably been the most profound, effective health promotion activity I've ever been involved in in 20 years of medicine. Richard, I'm wondering, it's interesting that, that at the moment mental health, I think, has got a really um, strong push, but it's at a time when a lot of what people would have done for their mental health perhaps isn't possible. So what are you doing or also maybe what are you suggesting to people that are some really good mental health strategies in a time when, yeah, we're restricted? Yeah, it's, yeah, absolutely. It's been, been difficult. It's interesting. I think it's been a again the people being creative around what we can do through digital technology but uh, some of the clips in there they might have seen um, our silver top stance group that we put together which is all about a dance class for our uh, older generation the less mobile um, people with wisdom and yeah they've really struggled i've got to say because they they're not as savvy with the internet and zoom meetings and gatherings um, our dance school has had a couple of uh, two um, meetings where we all got on and had a bit of a boogie in our houses, and it but it has been particularly hard for our silver tops. Um, so we are looking forward to um, uh, getting back together very soon, and we've had little visits of flowers, but and and cards and keeping in contact. But um, yeah, I guess yes, for me, I. I tried to maintain a routine of um, exercise and getting out into the open world and and putting together some funny dance videos with my son and, and putting that online as when we could. They uh, should keep you going as well. <laughs> uh, oh, seriously, thank God for dogs oh, or yeah. pets, pets in general. I had a conspiracy theory that it wasn't a bad, it was a dog that conspired around this whole coronavirus. <laughs> To get treated well for company. Um, yeah, it's interesting though. I was I was reflecting on uh, uh, how life has been much simpler, and I I wonder, and probably contradicting myself, but um, I did have a very heavy schedule of well-being exercise in terms of mushroom song and dancing dancing sort of a stressful three. regime of mental health exercise <laughs> <laughs> anxiety induced so perhaps i think what might come out of this is i'm hoping is that let, actually the simpleness of life um uh we can gain connection through friends and family through through the digital world more more readily and um, but also yeah, just connecting with nature and going for walks and the things we could do, um, the simple things I need to hand, hold on to, and also not to get yeah you know, I do like the whole concept of creating a new normal and um, I am looking at looking forward to getting back into a more connection through dancing but um, and qigong and my other exercises but I need to re rethink the balance um, of having something on every day. Um, mm just uh, being able to find that time to actually do nothing and mm. and sit in the sun and and we talk about dogs I loved a little post about cats they they nap they nap often 
they follow the sun around during the day and every now and then they might run through the house screaming, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, they do. I, I've got a student at school today. I, um, I ta- I've been taking my dog in to work and it's been great. And the kids um, greet him every day and say good day, and it means I'm chatting more readily with them. And I had a student who plays three sports who is loving having no sports. Mm. having nothing that she's spending time with family and yeah simplicity is the key Mm. I'm just looking at time and I really um wanted to know about your theme that I think really resonates which is that one about hope I don't know if any of the listeners or watchers I keep saying listeners because I think I'm on the radio um Viktor Frankl wrote the man's search for meaning and it's a really amazing book and he spoke like you Lucy about that that element of hope being what ties life together and is the reason we keep on going. Yeah. Um, what are you feeling hopeful about yeah. at the moment? Oh. <laughs> yeah, you've got. For me, all the, right, the, you've got six minutes. <laughs> there were some fantastic things that came out through these last couple of months, and I really just want to acknowledge the community that we live in um, and what people have done to help the health professional we had donations of gear for our protection we had um, people knocking on the door two people knocked on the door with free washing machines to help us do our scrub laundry we mm. I walked into uh, one of our my favorite cafes in town and they said oh you're a doctor you don't need to pay someone's just come in and given a massive donation for for healthcare workers to have free beverages through the cafes and mm. lots of donations like that mm. and people creating masks out of nothing face shields donated out of nothing mm. oh, not out of nothing a lot of hard work but we really appreciate it and I was in tears sometimes with the effort that people have gone to to rally together to do what they could to keep our community safe you know there's been a lot of you know, talking about healthcare workers being on the front line, but I kept saying it's the community on the front line that are managing this pandemic and um, mm. the, the generous spirit out there has just been overwhelming some, a lot of the time and so I want to acknowledge the community for that. Mm, that's fantastic. What about you, Lucy? Um, well, I'll probably speak more about the profession more broadly. Um, I also have been given huge hope by Richard um, in his story about how the communities rallied and his colleagues have come together as a team too. Um, but I, when I first wrote the book, um, I only ever considered myself a story catcher and I wanted to be in the background. I wanted the doctor's voices to be the story. Um, and I thought I'd done my job. Like I was like, here we are, here, here are the stories. But um, uh, and you know, these are going to change the world. <laughs> um, and then I realised you have to actually go out and sell your work. Um, so I had to then start finding platforms to speak about um, some of the themes that had come out through the stories and the, and how meaningful they were. And and so I started getting on, you know, invited to conferences and events, and and I would I would share these stories, and and doctors in the audience would be in tears um, with the recognition and, and, and the relief that somebody was actually working towards cultural change in the profession where that vulnerability is is allowed and where kindness is is a thing and kindness towards oneself, as you've heard from Richard's story, then they, it, I don't think it comes naturally um, to stop and reflect on self-care, but also, um, you know, there's a lot of work done around patient safety and quality and um, patient-centred care, but what wasn't really being acknowledged in that work was ha- um, that the major safety issue in healthcare systems is is um, is not, you know, infection and mistakes. It's actually how staff treat each other, and there's a huge amount of bullying and dehumanisation in the profession. Not to mention, you know, really pretty dire mental health statistics. So, um, so there's a big group of people internationally pushing for more compassion and more kindness in healthcare systems. And that's been a really uphill battle and I've become part of that push um, and very passionate about it. And um, and all of a sudden, that's now acceptable language and mm-hmm. mainstream um, representative bodies for the profession and for healthcare cultures more broadly, uh, reaching out to those of us, well, I wouldn't name myself in this mix, but some of the people who I interviewed for my book who are real pioneers in changing healthcare cultures, um, who are finally getting a voice and a platform and some recognition and some acknowledgement. And I've been part of 
um, the Gathering of Kindness, which is an Australian movement for um, you know, bringing kindness cultures and conversations into healthcare settings. Um, and also mo more recently, a pandemic kindness website, which is a national tool for um, clinicians to, to bring together all the resources that have been developed around um, kindness. And my, my group, my subgroup that I'm part of is called Love and Belonging. I mean, three years ago, mm -hmm. you would just not have heard the words love and belonging in a clinical context. So I think that's super powerful and super hopeful. And like many of us who have seen beautiful um, silver linings at this time, I, I have so much hope for the profession that this is a lasting silver lining for them. Yeah, and I, 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 early on in particular, I would get up in the morning and the first thing I would look at would be the Kindness Pandemic, which was a Facebook page, and just read stories of people that had posted about lovely things that had happened to them that people had done, like what you were talking about, Richard, and setting myself up for the day with those stories in my brain rather than the, the mm -hmm. dire straits that people were finding themselves in. Mm -hmm. Really, really important. Yeah. I'm just noticing we've got about a minute to go. Um, Is there a poem? Have we got time for a poem? I reckon that's a great way for us to see uh, the interview out. Um, I, I reckon if we end on that poem, but I just want to say a really big thank you to you both. I think, Lucy, the stories that you brought to the community, but also, Richard, the work that you do, it's incredibly important, both of you, so thanks. Thanks so much, Lucy. Thanks, thanks for you. your time. Love your work, Lucy. Yeah. <laughs> My pleasure. That's another interview. Teachers on the front line. <laughs> yes. Yep, yeah, I'm up for that. Yep. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, so I've got two poems here. They're short, don't worry. Um, by one of the doctors who I interviewed for my book, who's also a writer and a poet, um, as well as a GP in New Zealand. His name's Dr. Glenn Pahoon. Uh, this first one is called Today, I Don't Want to Be a Doctor. Today, I do not want to be a doctor. No one is getting any better. Those who were well are sick again, and those who are sick are sicker. The dying think that they will live, and the healthy think they are dying. Someone has taken too many pills. Someone has not taken enough pills. A woman is losing her husband. A husband is losing his wife. The lame want to walk, the blind want to drive. The deaf are making too much noise. The depressed are not making enough. The asthmatics are smoking, the alcoholics are drinking, the diabetics are eating chocolate. The mad are beginning to make sense. Everyone's cholesterol is high. Disease will not listen to me, even when I shake my fist. And then poem number two. Today, I want to be a doctor. Today, I'm happy to be a doctor. Everyone seems to be getting better. Those who were sick are not so sick, and those who were well are thriving. The healthy are grateful to be alive and the dying are at peace with their dying. No one has taken too many pills. No one has taken too few. A woman is returning to her husband. A husband is returning to his wife. The lame accept chairs. The blind ask for dogs. The deaf are listening to music. The depressed are tapping their feet. The asthmatics have stopped smoking. The alcoholics have stopped drinking. The diabetics are eating apples. The mad are beginning to make sense. Nobody's cholesterol is high. Disease has gone weak at the knees. I expect him to make an appointment. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. Thank you so much. No worries. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs>